Welcome to another episode of the All in the Water podcast. I'm Jimmy Fee. I've got Chris Megan and Kevin Blinkoff with me. And uh, guys, you know what really grinds my gears? <laughs> what what grinds your gears? Jimmy? <laughs> Are we supposed to reiterate? Is it too late for a Family Guy reference? Like, will anybody get that? Somebody I think, will. I think everyone's going to get that one. But anyhow, this podcast, we're going to be talking to Dustin Stevens and Johnny Rigo. But before that... Uh, we put out to our Instagram followers, what are your fishing pet peeves? And uh, first off, Kevin, what's a pet peeve? I know you looked that up. Yeah, I did look that up. So so a pet peeve is something that annoys you, but it's like a minor annoyance, but to you it's a big deal. So it's something that really isn't that consequential, but it kind of becomes this thing that you focus on and it becomes a big deal to you. It comes from the old word peevish. I'm getting a little peevish. <laughs> yes. Is, is, we're, not, we're not talking about pet peeves in the office, right? <laughs> No, well, we can get to that. We can air our, that. That's for the Festivus airing of grievances. <laughs> Another like 90 sitcom <laughs> reference. We'll full of those. So anyhow, I don't think we've ever gotten a stronger response to a question we put on Instagram than uh, the pet peeves one. I have, I don't know, hundreds, maybe over a thousand an- answers. How many and, from our staff? <laughs> <laughs> that's, they're in a different file. But a lot of them were, there was a whole lot of upside down spinning reels people that seems to really bother people when they see somebody out there and they're using a spinning reel instead of a, a spinning reel hangs below the rod when you're retrieving it but uh some people who are new to fishing you know think of like a classic fishing picture it's always the reel above the rod a conventional reel you so see they, that on a lot of movies and a lot of commercials you, you like i don't know what it is and that is absolutely a pet peeve of mine and i put it out to my wife every time it's like look at that idiot look at it look at it like how could they not have somebody on the set that knows enough to tell them to turn that thing upside down. You know, turn it right side up, I should say. But you see that on commercials all the time. It's a beautiful commercial. Guy's about to die, and, and he's celebrating the end of his life. And they have some medication that's going to extend it. And all of a sudden you look at it, it's like, yeah, but we're out here fishing. We'll turn the rod around, all right? Yeah, nothing undermines a Cialis commercial more than not knowing which, uh, I mean, or maybe it explains it. Not knowing um, how to hold the rod. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving on. So, <laughs> so that was a big one. Uh, being crowded was another one. People said when people see me catching fish and move up and uh, and fish right next to me, that's one. And there were a couple that were, were a little bit more specific. Uh, some that were downright personal. Somebody wrote Cheech's Lucky Charms. Uh, Lucky Charm. That came from Andrew Burke. Um, somebody wrote just wrote Jimmy Fee. I'm their pet peeve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That stung. But that's first. Another one said uh low balling the size of the fish i caught so <laughs> so somebody they that almost came out my nose the pet peeve was saying how big do you think this fish is and when somebody underestimates it but i will flip it and say my pet one of my fishing pet peeves is when people ask me to estimate the size of their fish because there's no good answer right kevin we've talked about this right you either overestimates that they don't feel bad and then turns out the fish is smaller and all of a sudden they feel bad or you're honest and then their feelings are hurt because in their mind the brown trout is much bigger than it it actually is so so this is a personal story now and i love the way that jimmy you just you you actually painted me in a corner with that the fact that i asked him to 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 give me an estimate on the size of my brown trout i caught in upstate new york two years ago and he, he absolutely low up by four or five pounds and and he did it in such a way that he was looking at me straight face he said i i'll give you 13 14 pounds it was all of 18 pounds and you did that that was a pet peeve of mine to me i'm not gonna get get into the details of how big i think your 14 pound brown trout is but you did you caught this beautiful brown trout you go man how big do you think that everybody's was? seen that fish but that's an impossible question because if i say it's too big you go, oh, just be yeah, honest. Th- no, but then you think Jim overestimates the size of all of his fish. Oh, that's, that's if true. I, if I say it's too big. If I say it's too small, then, you know, I'm trying to undermine you. But I was honest in my assessment and, and feelings were hurt. And it's brought up to this day two years later. So. It's, it's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, <laughs> another one from the guys at the Saltwater Edge was people not <clears throat> trimming the tag end of their knots. Ooh, Ooh. I feel a little personally attacked there. Um, you know what's a pet peeve of mine is when people pay attention to the details of other fishermen. You know, if uh, if a fisherman doesn't feel like trimming his tag ends of his knots, that shouldn't bother you. It, it bothers me because I look over and Kevin's surf fishing and the knot looks like look, looks like a tarantula at the top of his yeah. leader of, of braided line and tag ends. You don't trim yours. Yes, I do. Oh, you, you, you've been mating on our boat for how many, uh, how many times have you left the tag end? 
Well, he doesn't trim your tag end when he ties your lure on for you. <laughs> but people, you know, the argument is it doesn't matter if you trim the tag end or not. Like the fish has to ignore so many things already to hit your lure or your bait. You know, it's ignoring the hook. Disagree. It's ignoring you the... You got to trim uh, the tag end. I, I think so. I think it's just, it's just a cleaner presentation. I think it looks much better. Um, but if you're in a rush, I, I don't know. I, I don't leave tag end, so I don't even know if it matters or not. I've never just Just tie a monkey paw. There. In the future, I think it's just as easy as what you're referring to as my tag ends was I tied a really bulky knot that wiped out a couple micro guides on a rod while we were <laughs> I think haddock I hit fishing. A nerve. I think I hit a nerve here. We were haddock fishing in May and I tied a uni to uni knot, but it was really heavy line and it wasn't my best work. But when we brought it through the guides and it was a, a kind of a prototype slow pitch rod that had really tiny blew up, guides. Blew out the top two guys. <laughs> it's not, didn't make it out. through it. It took a couple guides He's with like, it. He's like, Chris, that's a wine on leader. Go ahead and cast it. Snaps that. <laughs> So that's a pet peeve of mine. Moving on, another popular one: jet skis on the flats. That was a uh, that was a big one. A lot of people hate jet skis, and uh, I, I'm one of them. I used to. It, I don't notice it as much up here in New England, but down in New Jersey, New York, especially in the back bays, they were brutal. You know, you'd be fishing on a pier sometimes. I, I've seen them wipe out the lines of everybody fishing bait on the pier, and um, you know that. I'm sure it's not intentional. They're, they're running around so fast, they're not taking the time to look at the fishermen, but they can. They spook the fish. They, they wrap up your line. Jet skis are a, are a menace. We have more uh, water skiers up this way that I've had a problem with. I'm in somewhere fly fishing, and you get a, somebody who's just doing circles, doing you know water skiing in that area. Well, I, pet peeve. Yeah, I feel like if you open it up to, like, jet skis, you, you might as well open it up to, like, you know, everything. I mean, yes, I agree with you, but it's like, Hey, the ferry's a pet peeve when it comes to, you know, when it comes to the channel and you're out fishing in the middle of the channel. That's a pet peeve. I mean, you, you got to, like, we got to, we got to, we got to narrow the focus. Yeah. So. There, there were like 50 people who just said like other fishermen, my pet peeve. Like there's just, there's just a lot of angry, grumpy fishermen on Instagram. I think somebody wrote, they said other people who use the lake for things other than fishing, <laughs> which I think was a funny sort of joke, sort of pointing fun at themselves. Yes. Uh, another one was when people label fish as trash, but those fish are often tasty, fun to catch, and look interesting. That's uh, that's true. You know, there's a lot of fish. You definitely that, wrote that. Oh, I didn't write that. You no, wrote. no, there was somebody else. I didn't write down their Instagram handle, but it was uh, it was somebody else. One, and I, I've got feelings about this one too, is a non-reciprocated invitation. So if I invite Kevin to go fishing, and then he doesn't invite me to go fishing later, I, that's got to be a huge pet peeve. No. It, there's a way to to do an invitation like if i know kevin's on a great bite and he's he's got a spot dialed in where he's catching a lot of big stripers and i'm not catching so many but i'll be like hey kevin would you like to go fishing for black sea bass with me and then I'm like oh if you ever want to go you know if you ever need somebody to join you on your big striper spot so it's it's not even the invites have to be even you have to be able to offer something uh, what about our pet peeves? do we get pet peeves? The, yeah yeah we're hypothetically we're, speaking somebody owns a boat somebody doesn't own a boat and, and when it's time to go on the boat, that guy's your best friend. But when there's an incredible shore bite, and the guy that owns the boat really isn't in tune with the shore bite, he doesn't get called in. And then the next day, I don't know, over the lunchroom, there's all sorts of banter about how great the fishing was in the shore bite. And you just took that guy out on the boat. That's a pet peeve. Yeah, that must be frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know anyone that does that, Jimmy? No, I don't. But there is a good tuna bite if you'd like to uh, take me soon. All right, let's get back to the pet peeves from the audience. Lame fishing expressions like that's why they call it fishing and not catching. Yep. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Along those lines, the joke, the, the off, often repeated joke of here's how to eat the undesirable fish to eat. Here's the recipe for it where the people are like, oh, you, you take it and you marinate it for three nights and then you put it under a brick and you cook it and then you eat the brick. Like that joke I've heard a million iterations of it from my time working at the tackle shop to my time working the trade shows up here to everybody says that one. That, that's one that we can, we can put that away. We can retire that joke for now. Yeah, that's one's done. Put a fork in it. So we, we got two from, um, from this person, from Sean R. Layton. And he was clearly, uh, just, just by the nature of them, he's definitely a mate on a party boat. And one of them is overhead, overhand casters on boats. That is a big no-no on a party boat. It's one thing if you're on a, on a private boat and you're casting, but sling, if you're on a party you boat, sling it underneath. you've got people all over the place and you're going to try to cast overhand. That's, uh, that creates a pretty dangerous situation. And then his other one was people who don't listen to the mates when they don't know uh, WTF they're doing was the other one. And that's true. If you're on a party boat, the mates are there every day. 
uh, listen to them. You know, they'll, they know how to keep you out of the tangles and, and keep you into the fish. Uh, another one in that vein that people wrote up was headphones. Of all of these responses, we get just a ton of them. What was, what was the number one pet peeve? What was the ones that kind of jumped out the most? Upside down spinning reels. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? I'm going to jump in on that one. I'm going to go on a little <laughs> bit of a rant. Um, I, Chris, I agree with you. A pet peeve when you see it in an advertisement or something like that, when they're misrepresenting fishing and they're, they're fishing wrong. But if I'm out in public and I just see someone fishing with an up, upside down spinning reel, I mean, that's not a pet peeve. That doesn't bother me. That makes me think we're doing a bad job showing people how to fish. We in general, like, yeah. you know, I mean, that's something, Chris, we've yeah, talked about a yeah. lot. We want more people fishing. We want more people to get into fishing. You know, the truth is the sport is declining as people are aging out. Whoops. It's gesturing toward you. And I hit the microphone <laughs> as people are aging out of fishing. We're starting to lose fishermen. And the more people we have fishing, the better it is for the sport, for conservation, for protecting access. Um, I couldn't agree more. No, you, you hit the nail on the head. And you know what it is? I, I, uh, it's a pet peeve because you got to imagine how much money they spend on this commercial or or this you know movie that they're doing. Like, like how does somebody on there, the key grip yes. has to be a fisherman. How is he not going home and smacking that person upside the head and telling them to flip it around? I mean, somebody on that set is a fisherman and how they allow it to get all the way through with the money they, they spend to, to produce that commercial or that, that TV show or whatever it is that way. But to your point, if I see somebody like that, I will go over and, 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 and try to educate them. And oftentimes what happens is they reel with the opposite hand. And they don't realize I can back the handle off and flip it to the other side. Most of these reels today, you can actually back that reel handle off. You can kind of take it to the other side and you find out that that person, Neil Larson, our general manager, used to, he's a lefty. And, and I can't tell you how many times I would pick up the rod when we were out on a shoot. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fishing opposite hand with it. And it just feels weird. And yeah. I understand why they would flip that upside down. And I think that, to your point, Kev, one of the things that we need to do is just educate them that a lot of these reels today, majority of these reels, you can flip that handle the other way and, and kind of eliminate that. Plus, so many people you see, you know, before you fish, if you see pictures of fishing, you watch the movie Jaws, you see representations, the reel is a conventional reel on top of the rod. The first reel that almost everybody fishes with is a Zepco, a Zepco. spin caster. Yeah. It's on top. That's the way you hold it. The rod's in right. your left hand, you're dealing with the right. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine that we make fishing more difficult than it should be sometimes we don't make it easy to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I know how to spit, hold a spinning reel because my dad put it in my hands. He fished, his dad fished. I had a mentor, you know, so I'm privileged in that way. Whereas a lot of people try to pick up the sport, pick it up new. You put a spinning reel in somebody's hands yeah, and no, right. yeah, it sort of almost makes sense. I'm going to put it on top like I've always seen. And, and so yeah, pet peeve of mine, we need to do a better job making fishing accessible and growing the sport. Wow, turned into a little bit of a PSA yeah, wow. there. PSA, point well taken, Kevin. I, I think really well said. I agree with you 100%. So one of the other ones beyond the upside down spinning reel that people didn't like was spot burning. But the one that was actually, that is more of my pet peeve is the overly aggressive response to spot burning. So yes. often on social media, what ends up being much more damaging to your spot that, that's been burned is is yelling at the person for making the post, bringing attention to the fact that it's a spot burn, that ends up bringing way more attention to it than if you just saw it and were like, oh, I, I wish this hadn't happened, but I'm going to let it go. There, there have been times I've seen um, a complaint on, like you said, there's a complaint about this is a spot burn, this is terrible. And I'm like, oh, it's a spot burn. Well, let me take a closer look at that picture and see if I can figure out what is this spot that this person's so protective of. Improper handling uh, of striped bass or any fish was, was another one that came up pretty frequently. But like the upside down spinning reels, in a lot of those cases, that's a, it's not somebody who doesn't care. It's not somebody that's trying to it's hurt the education. fish. It's an education. It's somebody that it's doesn't know. And uh, you could take that as an opportunity. <clears throat> we, we talked about this earlier in an earlier podcast. Take it as an opportunity to say, hey, you know, it's better for the fish if you do it this way. Support it horizontally. Don't let it roll around and get covered in sand. Uh, somebody called that the shake and bake striper on there. That was one of their pet peeves. Uh, this one I just thought was funny. Uh, it, it goes along the lines of overcrowding. But uh, if you're jigging for tuna and people troll so close to you, it seems like they're trying to catch the fish out of your fish box. Uh, that's a good one. I've been in those fleets where everybody's catching on jigs and you still have guys that are trolling around there. And I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand why guys don't switch over and start jigging with everybody else that they'd rather stay on the troll when, to me at least, jigging and, and popping is a much more fun and interactive way to catch the tuna. I mean, trolling has its 
you know, is, is also great. But I think uh, a lot of times the trolling is just to find the fish or locate them, depending on your electronics. It can help you to identify where these fish are hanging, and then the people will change over. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think the jigging and popping is so much funner. And this is one that I'm guilty of. When people who aren't fishing or necessarily fishing look in your bucket or, or – uh, this says in your cooler, but I, I've never opened somebody else's cooler to peek in there. But if I'm not fishing, I'm walking you, the beach with my kids and somebody's fishing. You took my lunch one day. You literally opened my cooler and took my lunch. That didn't happen. That was, we own a shoot backside of Monomoy. I'm all right, Jimmy. Let's another day. No, I don't think that happened. I, I remember you, you threw out the best calzone I ever ate. And I was co- going to come back to it later. That was a pet peeve. All right. Pet peeve of mine that I just thought of. Somebody else eats the lunch that, like, you get sandwiches oh, on a fishing trip, and somebody pet- else eats your sandwich, and you're left with the one that they got, which is I like... I did not do that. Just look at Jimmy. That's so not me. So two days in a row, we fished together uh, Crocodile Bay in Costa Rica. Two days in a row, you ate my sandwich. Oh, right. So on the third day, right. I purposely ordered the, <laughs> he's like, right. super spicy tuna yep. and asked to get it extra spicy. Yep. No, he's right on this one. <laughs> Knowing that you would eat it the next day. So on the third I, you day. You know what? I didn't realize at the time, in my defense, I did not realize at the time that, that we were like custom ordering. I didn't get that memo. Do you remember I was left off the email? And Michelle was like, Chris, you never ordered any sandwiches. So I just assumed that all the sandwiches that were put in there were everyone's game. So Kevin goes ahead and sets it up the most spicy thing I've ever eaten in my life. And I like inside of three hours. And I'm you looking, got Irish taste buds. Uh, yeah. It's a real first world problem that you guys like, who ate my delicious sandwich at my luxury fishing lodge? No, well, I custom ordered the one I he wanted. Did. He did. And he poured all sorts of stuff on it that. It had thing. the good aioli on it. Oh, yeah, it I'm up here eating crackers in the surf. So <laughs> that is, you know what? That is a pet peeve. And I, I will, you're right. I made a mistake. I'll let you buy me lunch after this. Make up for I, it. We just, <laughs> that's going to happen anyways. But yes, I will do that. I think that's, uh, oh, dropping weights on the deck of a boat. I always hear it when I drop a jig or a bank sinker on one of Chris's boats. I know that's one of your Do you do that? Do you do that? You know how I know Jimmy's fishing on my boat? When I hear the bank shake, I hit the hull. (laughs) That's that's why when I forget that Jimmy's on the boat, I'm like, oh, bam, there's a hull. Bam, there's another one. Oh, there's the deck. Oh, Jimmy's fishing with me today. That reminds me. I owe you an antenna. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know what? I didn't even mind that. So we were fishing. Kevin and I were on the new Skeeter 25, and uh, he's fly fishing. He's become a very good fly fisherman. But he's on the bow. I'm on the stern, and we have an antenna that they put on midship, and uh, he's casting. He caught it once, and I'm like, do you want me to move that? No, no, you're good. I won't hit that again. Gone. Into the water. <laughs> and the thing that was great about that is, is your description of it, how it danced. Oh, it landed up. This, this metal antenna, like, flipped through the air and landed on the uh, gunnel of the boat standing up. And it was like sort of doing this on the side of the boat. And I'm watching it going like. And you felt like oh, you had enough fall. time to grab it. It's going like, to fall in it's the boat. Fall on the boat. And I swear it started to fall on the boat. And then it kind of spun around, landed on there, and then just rolled into the water and splashed. But it was 30 seconds after I told you, you don't have to put that <laughs> antenna down. I'm not going to hit it a second time. And that's not even a pet peeve of mine. But you know what? You know, playing bumper pool with a, uh, with a bank sinker on the, the hull of a boat. Yeah, that's a pet peeve of mine. Oh, here's one that I know really bothers you. Someone gets, comes on your boat, and they've got a full Yeti mug of coffee to the brim, and you're about to leave the harbor, and they haven't even taken a sip out of it. Throw it in a cup holder on the console. Yep. So now you take off and you start going, and the top half of the coffee just sloshes all over it. Right in the suck hole. Pow. <laughs> right. Right in the cycle. And here's the other thing is when that person brings it on and it's actually too big to fit the cup holder. Mm-hmm. So they wedge it in there with a shoehorn. Uh, we back on me. Where they wedge it in. water jug. Like, just bring a regular mug. Oh, yeah. Like you everybody bring, else. He brings a giant brings Yeti a that doesn't fit in the cup holder. Nope. And within five minutes, that thing has fallen out of the cup holder. And you just hear that hit the deck of the it's boat. It's like bowling pins roll to the, the back. back of the yeah. oh, it's yeah. a 64-ounce jug of water that I bring on the boat just to get, uh, I'm a thirsty but you, boy. There's no place on the boat for you to put that 64 ounce jug. And you know that you bring it every single time. And the thing's out back. The thing is you're playing handball against the side of the wall, uh, the, the, the uh, gunnel of the wall back and forth. And Jimmy actually has a snicker. That's a pet peeve of mine. When you snicker at the, the interior of the boat being kicked around. Okay, okay, here's one of my pet peeves. Then. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's going to be personal. <laughs> is this eating eating muffins on a boat? Eating like blueberry muffins and just sprinkling the crumbs and then grinding them into the right, floor, Jimmy? I have Shabil never done that. that. I am calling Patrick Shabiel. He <laughs> did an Irish step dance. He did an Irish step dance on, on a... Uh, on, he, he had a blueberry muffin. I don't know what happened, but next thing you know, it's on the thing. We hooked up to, in his defense, we caught some fish. Next thing you know, he's doing an Irish jig on this, on this uh, blueberry muffin. 
it looked like roadkill on my deck. <laughs> Blueberries everywhere. There was just it was horrific. Food, certain foods on the boat. So there were a lot of boat owner yeah. pet peeves. Uh, sunflower seeds seems to be, be the biggest one because of the shells get everywhere. They get plastered onto the boat. Tough to get off the boat. I could see that, especially on uh, party boats. There's a lot of people, for whatever reason, eating sunflower seeds. Oh, yeah, that was one. Uh, <laughs> I got another pet peeve. Go ahead. Uh, like, like, I agree. You catch a nice fish and Albies bleed like. Mm, they well, just this bleed. is where I was going with the pet peeve. Yes. So you're in the middle of a great bite. Somebody's just landed a tuna, and we're going to spend 10 minutes cleaning the boat before we run to the other school of tuna that's been on top for 10 minutes and goes down the second the boat's spick and span, and we can resume fishing again. There's some boat owners that have such, and I'll put, this is definitely a pet peeve because it's really a minor thing, but in their minds, they blow it up. They feel like as soon as there's blood on the boat, they, you need to like bleach the boat, scrub it, get it pristine, because if that, God forbid, the blood sits there for more than 30 seconds, boat's ruined. I can see where that would be a pet peeve. Along that same line, my pet peeve is when you get home at the end of the day and you're left washing the boat alone and there's just blood <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> there's, there's blood everywhere. And the people you fish with that day didn't care to wash it down when they could have washed it off easily. And there's just, the next thing you know, you find yourself, you know, in your late 50s scrubbing a boat and everyone else is gone. They're sitting, they're sitting in front of the TV. I will say there was, there was one time that I helped wash the boat and I did see what you meant. Uh, yeah. yeah. If Just, you let the blood dry, it goes from being like a, 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 a five second cleanup to like a five minute scrub. Oh, wait, were you talking about me early with yeah. the whole blood? Oh. Being anal about the blood? Oh, I didn't. Because I wasn't did, talking did about you not realize that? No, no, no. Wow. no. <laughs> No, that was absolutely. We were out there with your son. Are you talking about me, guys? I was because we were out there with your son-in-law, and I'm watching these tuna go crazy, and we were getting every last I was drop of blood. You, Jimmy, you're the guy that like next thing you know, we get back to the dock, I'm like, hey, had a great time. I'll see you tomorrow morning. That I happened go one time because <laughs> Kevin. How many times did you come back to the house to scrub the boat? Remember that one time he's like, uh, looks like we're putting my dog down right now. I got to take <laughs> off. That was the most like extreme excuse you to get out of washing the boat. You put that dog down three times in the course of six months. <laughs> Absolutely not. You did. It died one time last August, and it just happened to be while I was on you the Benito said, trip. and I quote, I would be here cleaning, but Pam, this means a lot to her, so we're going to go and put the dog down. Like two weeks later, he put the dog down again. <laughs> you did. At least three times in about two months. And I'm sitting there scrubbing the boat. I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? So, yes, I could see where it, it would be a It is a great peeve. excuse, though, because you, you can't be like, no, really? No, I couldn't say Your a damn dog? thing. Like, you know, we love dogs. We're not going to No, not I couldn't fight say that. a damn thing. I just, I thought he had three dogs, and it was like months It would make later. sense. He's got six grandmas that have passed away. <laughs> <laughs> it was the years. months later that I learned that you had one dog. Somehow that thing didn't go to the light, and, and you had to put it down like a month later. But anyways, yes, I can see where it'd be a pet peeve that, yes, I want to wash my damn boat because I know that you're not coming back to scrub it. God knows you're not scrubbing it. Kevin came back last time to scrub it. He got a whole new and you know, uh, um, res respect for what it takes to scrub blood three hours later. Sorry that my uh, butt is clean. I guess that was me. We should have put a trigger warning on this. Uh, okay, another one. People who think my boat runs on thanks. My friend's dad has that sign on his boat. It says, this boat runs on gas, not thanks. I could see where that, that has never bothered me. I will say that. Uh, I feel like the crew that comes out puts their time in. That has never bothered me. I don't mind. I Wait, always, you, always offer. You always offer. You, yeah, you always, always do. You two always, always have. Every time you guys Jonah offer. takes me out, I tell him, ask gas or grass. It's up to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that one's gonna make. <laughs> Nobody rides for free though. <laughs> so pet peeve of mine is when people come on the boat and they start setting up gear and they set it up and the next thing you know the deck of the boat looks like a yard sale on a Saturday, and and people haven't come to start buying stuff yet and it's just shit everywhere. That's a pet peeve of mine because you know what it is. I look at it from a safety point of view. When you get out on the water and you're coming around the back, or you're fighting a fish, and the next thing you know, you're stepping on a, you're stepping on a Plano box or a, a 64 ounce, you know, Yeti <laughs> Yeti mug. I don't know who would do that, but anyways, you're, you're back there and just just crap everywhere. And it's like I don't like a clean deck, you know. Um, yes, deck. we know. But seriously, Jimmy, you come on the boat 
And you spread you spread out like I do. I, you I spread like to, out like you, you like your your parents just moved you into a college dorm. I need a good workspace, Chris, since I'm doing all the rigging for the other people on board. Yeah, I, I don't know what the that 64 ounce Yeti mug is, has to do with rigging. You need your first mate hydrated, Chris. <laughs> this right, has so, become a real airing yeah, of grievances. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this whole thing took on a life of its own. Uh, one another uh, reader one I didn't mention. This is something that used to bother me, but it doesn't anymore. It, it bothered me when I was uh, when I was younger. Uh, uh, people online uh, misrepresenting their fish, saying the fish was bigger than it actually is, and that's something I realized. I, I, it used to annoy me. Like, There's no way that fish is 40 pounds. And then we covered this. And then you became the victim of that constantly, oh, yeah. <laughs> nonstop. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, this. Why do these people care? This isn't affecting them at all. And uh, I realized it wasn't affecting me at all. So you want to say your striped bass is 55 pounds? Go right ahead. It doesn't yeah. bother me. You're not going for a record. So make I, that I can see make that brown trout whatever size you want. If you're happy. <laughs> That's all that matters. Exactly. You're only you should only be fishing for yourself. Uh, you know Anyhow, it's about you. In full disclosure, I set up two separate accounts just to torture you on those, on those fish. So that was me. <laughs> Your fish ain't that big. That oh, was, that, that was one where Super Strike shared a photo of a fish. I think I said it was 26 pounds, and people people acted like I claimed it was the new world record. I mean, this is 10, 11 years ago. And they're like, no way, that's 26 pounds, like 26 inches, maybe. You know, that was always the, the classic one. If somebody, if somebody claims it's pounds, they go, maybe inches. Um, All right, it's, last pet peeve. It's so hard to judge in a picture because you, you don't know how big the angler is. There's no win on that. There's no win on that. And one of the last pet peeves for me, we'll wrap this thing up before it gets too personal here. And this is not anyone on our boat because Jimmy actually does not eat on the boat. But like, you're like, okay, who wants what for food on the boat? And so you kind of plan that out, you set it up, you get all your food together, and you have these folks that are like, I, I do not eat when I get on the boat. I'm not eating, and I, and I usually don't drink anything. And, and then you get on the boat, and this guy goes at it like it's his last supper. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he gets out of sight of land. <laughs> oh, I swear to God. It, it is like, this is this guy's last supper, and he's going at it like, you know, he's getting put to death tomorrow, and this is his last meal. And you're like, sweet Jesus, you said you're not eating when we get on the boat. So we kind of did the food based on you saying, like, I, the one thing I don't eat, one thing I don't do is eat on the boat because, I, you know, I'm not hitting the head. There is no head on the boat. But the next thing you know, this guy's eating like a Viking, and, and, and you're like two-thirds of the way through the trip, and everything's gone. It's kind of along the lines of somebody eating your sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Kevin, tell us a little, little bit about uh, the interview you had with uh, Dustin and Johnny, and what did you guys cover? So, uh, yes, up next, I chat with Dustin and Johnny, and Dustin runs a kayak guide service in Rhode Island. Um, Johnny works with him on the guide service, does some kayak guiding and also some shore guiding. And we really just kind of talked about what that's like. What about what's kayak fishing like in Rhode Island in general over the season? We touched on kind of where the fall runs at at this moment right now. And then, you know, what I think it's, it's a really interesting business, the idea of guiding people to kayak fishing and what some of the, the pluses and minuses of it are and, and what it means to be able to introduce people to the sport of fishing through kayaks. Today's episode of the On the Water podcast is brought to you by On the Water Apparel. Visit onthewater.com to shop our selection of original designs on high-quality apparel and accessories, including sweatshirts, tees, quarter zips, hats, belts, socks, and more. Use code OTWPOD, that's O-T-W-P-O-D, to save 15% on your next purchase. Today we have Dustin Stevens at the end here. He's the owner and operator of Rhode Island Kayak Fishing Adventures. You can also find him as Dustin Goes Fishing on Instagram. And then we have Johnny Rigo. Johnny is a guide along with Dustin. He does a lot of the shore guiding and also pitches in on some kayak fishing guiding as well. You can find him on his YouTube channel, Fishing with Johnny, and also on TikTok, big TikTok <laughs> guy, at Fish RI. Um, and right away, I just want to jump into it, guys. I felt a little bad bringing you both down here today because it's a beautiful day. And it seems like the Rhode Island fall run fishing is kind of at a peak. Uh, Dustin, can you just give us a quick update on like, what's the fishing like right now? It's first week of October. What are you seeing in Rhode Island waters? Uh, right now, it's a lot of good uh, striped bass and bluefish. Um, it pretty much blitzes. You can, it's kind of instant gratification. You go to the water and something's usually blitzing there. I mm -hmm. uh, haven't seen any albies in the past uh, few days in Rhode Island waters. Uh, and the tatog fishing is really good right now. Mm -hmm. And Johnny, you've been doing some shore fishing. What's the shore fishing been like? 
Uh, the nasty weather definitely helped out the striper bite quite a bit. I think we had like three straight days of like 25 plus mile an hour winds, big seas, and it pushed a really big school of big striped bass close to shore. Um, I was shore fishing Newport and a lot of overslot fish coming from casting out poppers, SP minnows, really anything. And it's funny, once the weather broke yesterday, that bite totally shut off. Oh, okay. So I don't feel too bad about bringing you down here <laughs> yeah, today. Yeah, so it's, it's good we're here today. So so we got the fall run going right now, going pretty well. But obviously, you guys with the kayak guiding business and then also doing some shore fishing as well, um, you fished through the entire season in Rhode Island. Yes. So let's start kind of from the beginning. How do you start your fishing season in Rhode Island? Um, what kind of fishing do you do? And, and, and what's that like in the very beginning in the springtime? Uh, for me, it's usually uh, fresh water. As soon as ice out happens, um, I'm usually going out for largemouth or, or trout. Um, that's kind of my time to get my bearings together for the season. And then once we get into April, um, it's kind of more of the same. And then you start looking for those, you know, fresh uh, migratory stripers and, uh, you know, kind of the tatal bite. I never really have luck in the first week of April. But um, I, I'm always looking for them. And then once we move into May, you start to get bigger stripers, more consistent bite. The t spring to tug bite is always awesome. Um, yeah, and then summertime, once June, July, August hits, is you know, big fish, um, stripers, blues, black sea bass. I even kind of come out this way a little bit for those. Um, September is all about Albie and Bonito. That's what everybody wants mm -hmm. to catch. And then once we get into October, you know, it's a little more striper and blue activity and then, you know, to talk for the rest of the year. Nice. Yep. And you, you run a kayak guiding, fishing guiding business where you take clients out um, on kayaks. What led you to starting that business? I'm guessing you were a kayak <laughs> fisherman before and yes. saw that, that need. Um, tell me a little bit about how that business got started. Right. Uh, yeah, I was a kayak, I was kayak fishing before that. Um, and when you're kind of known in the area to do pretty well, people always reach out, you know, where did you go? How did you catch them? You know, all these questions. And then I kind of sampled it the year before I launched it, just taking people out that I didn't know to see, you know, do I really like this? Can I really dedicate my all to it? It takes a lot of time. He knows that. Um, and then there it was, I launched it and you know, it's, it's been pretty good so far. Yeah, any kind of uh, charter business or guiding business, there's a huge difference between going out and fishing for yourself for fun and taking someone along and putting them on fish. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And just because you love fishing doesn't mean you'll love guiding and, and, and running a charter business. Doing it on kayaks has to be its own set of challenges. Oh, yeah. So what's that like when you're taking out someone? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you have clients from you know folks who are fishing, fishermen or, or anglers, but have never been in kayaks to folks who've you know, kind totally of new green. to the whole thing. Totally green. Absolutely. Um, I don't know where to start with challenges. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there we go. The number of people on our trips is a big factor. So yeah. I'll usually help out Dustin if we have like three or more guys coming out. Yep. So when you get three or four kayakers that you're in charge of and you need to make sure they're safe and ultimately catching fish, that can get a little stressful sometimes mm -hmm. because um, you're way more at mercy to the conditions on a kayak than you are in a boat. Right. So conditions boats can handle, kayakers necessarily can't handle. And if should, someone is yeah. should, yeah. <laughs> and if someone's totally green, and in with if you're out with four people who are totally green or five, or five, we've done that before. Um, that can be a lot of work. Right. I think, yeah, the quantity of kayakers is one of the biggest factors of how the trip will go. Um, but Dustin has ran into his own fair share of problems or just one, one or two, uh, kayakers. Uh, I would, yeah, I would say the biggest challenge is getting people to use the kayak. Cause when you, when you're out there in the morning and you know, people want to get going. So like when they see his videos or they see our social media, you know, that's what they expect to catch. So when they show up, you know, to the waterfront in the morning, they're ready to go. So when we're going through this, like pretty elaborate briefing that has grown and grown and grown <laughs> with uh, challenges that we face. They're kind of like out of sight, out of mind with that. Um, so when they get on the water, they're trying to get, you know, they're trying to get their bearings together with the kayak, how to deploy the rudder, how to put the drive in, you know, how to adjust their pedals, just different stuff like that. 
Um, and then one of the biggest challenge for some clients is keeping the rods and reels inside of the kayak and not at the bottom of the seafloor. Um, that's been <laughs> pretty challenging. Uh, how many rods and reels do you think you've lost? Oh, I think we're still in the single digits approaching double digits. Uh -huh. but yeah. Uh, too, too many. Too many. <laughs> yeah. Too many. And what, what kind of tactics? Uh, so you, I, I'm guessing, uh, most of your clients are tend to be in the summertime. Um, visitors Spring, summer, yep. and so you have a lot of taking them out for striped bass fishing yep. with folks who are kind of new to kayak fishing what what are the tactics you use how do you get them on fish usually i i think we always start our mornings trolling something mm -hmm. um it's not always the easiest thing to teach but some people are totally green and they don't know how to cast and we've run into that problem uh, quite a bit where it's like blitzing fish and it's like cast right there i don't know how to cast so um so we always start with a troll. And even if I'm on the water alone, sometimes I do the same thing. Uh, so tube and worm, uh, hard plastic minnows, you know, something like that and see if we can find a bite. And as the day go on, we adjust uh, accordingly, but um, we usually start trolling. I would say in the summertime months, we were almost exclusively using the tube for, for most, of most of the summer, just because the striper bite was pretty unbelievable for a while they just stayed stacked up for almost two months and it got to the point where we we're like okay follow me and in about 15 seconds you're probably going to get tight <laughs> and they just could not resist the tube and worm they don't um, want to switch after they start catching yeah That's when someone gets like a nice overslot fish on the tube they're like okay i'm sticking with this for the right. next five hours despite feeling pretty you know, indifferent about it to begin with. They're like, I want to throw a plug or, you know, I want to do something cool, the next cool lure. And it's like, just start with this, just trust us. And a lot of times, like he mentioned, they don't, they do not want to put it down. Yeah. yeah. That's actually the first time I went out, uh, kayak fishing for striped bass like that. Um, yeah, that's how I learned too. somebody yep. put a rod in my hand and said, okay, we're going to do trolling to and worm. And yep. I was like, Oh, this is, I like holding the rod. I like casting. Yep. I want to yep. catch fish. But even with the uh, rod and the rod holder in the kayak, you're trolling that tube. You got to pay attention to what you're doing. And then when that first hit comes from a big striped bass, All you're not holding the sense. rod, but you feel it through the whole kayak. That's right. something I think a lot of people don't realize. And that's an exciting, you know, it's not like trolling from a boat where you just see the rod go. Right. All of a sudden it feels like somebody has like, you know, kicked the back of the kayak and yep. you've got a fish on. So there's, yep. there's more excitement to it there than, than people realize. So that has to be, um, that has to be pretty rewarding when you put someone on a fish Absolutely. out kayak. That's, the, that's the best part about it. And what's that like for someone who's, you know, maybe never caught a, a bigger than a schoolie or, or caught a fish at all, maybe, and you're watching them fight a striped bass from a Hobie kayak? <laughs> it's really awesome. Um, it, it goes by so fast, especially when we have multiples. Like we've had several three and four person trips where double up, triple up or four people hooking up at the same time. And it's just <laughs> it just goes crazy from there. But just to see the excitement on their face, like during the fight itself and, you know, I'm I'm watching them, but I'm also barking in their ear, like, keep that line tight. Don't drop the fish. Don't flip over, you know, all this other stuff that's going on. Um, but it's it's so fun just to see them, just to see the joy and excitement on their face. And, you know, it's awesome. Nice. I'm guessing that's kind of what keeps you getting up every morning and doing it again. Really in the morning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and with the tube, like we, or anything we're trolling, we always make them like hold the rod. Like I'm pretty... OCD about that. It's like mm -hmm. hold it so you can detect, you know, all strikes that are coming. So, um, yeah, it's like no rod holders. Put that, put that rod in your hand, and when you get a bite, and then you know. So let's let's get a little more technical on that for a minute. Um, for anyone who's interested, and in, describe what that means. We're, we keep saying trolling tube and worm. Right. What's what's the setup like? Take me through rod reel. What what does the tube actually look like, and what's the technique? Uh, usually. We give most clients uh, spinning tackle, mm -hmm. um, anything from like a one to four or two to six rated rod, um, 4,000 size, three, three to 5,000 size. It just depends on the, the company. Um, I'm a light line guy. I think Johnny pretty much is too. So I'm using anything from like 20 to 30 pound braid at most uh, with going for stripers. Um, and with the tube, uh, I use uh, Butchie Built tubes and um well, johnny uses the hoagie tube and they both work for our clients um but yes yeah, this red uh red piece of plastic or black or green whatever color pink um 
and you pretty much just kind of do a countdown based on where you are. If we're fishing shallow water, it's going to be a, a you know much less of a countdown. Where if we're fishing deeper water, obviously you're going to count much longer. But I don't use any type of uh, line counters or anything like that. The less gear, the better for me. Right. <laughs> oh, Typical so, rule in kayak fishing. For sure. Yeah. So we just kind of give them, you know, the blueprint of, you know, how much line to have behind them and how fast to go. You know, in some places we fish, the terrain is like so up and down. So you just having mm-hmm. to coach them when to adjust that tube as well, because you don't really want to get to the client. They're just throwing it behind them and just blindly trolling because they're following us or following our lead. But, you know, there are actually some nuances as to when to bring your line up, when to let it drop deeper as you're going down drop offs and stuff. So uh, that's the stuff that we try to teach after they get a few fish under their belt. Nice. And Johnny, you mentioned that that has been really effective this summer in particular in Rhode Island. Um, what has been, you know, you, I don't, you don't need to give away any of your spots, but like, <laughs> what do you think was going on this summer? Were there certain areas that just kind of held fish and what made that so effective? Yeah, there was definitely certain areas that just seemed to hold fish a little longer than previous seasons. Um, it got to the point where I think, Dustin, what was it? June was our hottest month. By far. Okay. Yeah, I got to a point in June where we'd launch kayak out, I don't know, five minutes, if that, and our fish finders were just blowing up with fish. Mm-hmm. And a lot of fish came up over 40 inches, too, on the tube. They weren't just small stripers stacked up. Um, so it got to the point where, I mean, I can't speak on how the fishery is doing it. I'm not a marine biologist, but <laughs> it just seemed like there was, a large, <laughs> uh, there was a large biomass of fish that mm-hmm. were just hanging in our neck of the woods Mm -hmm. and they were crushing the tube um the fish were cooperating is a good way to uh yeah describe that that's that's great it's you know it did seem like in june um and you guys are fishing generally in narragansett bay is that the good thing about june is you have options that you're either um on the ocean front or way further up the bay like it's Mm -hmm. kind of fish everywhere you know so you can which, which helps as a guy because if it's too nasty to go out front, then you can kind of tuck into the bay and still be on pretty much the same class of fish. So, yeah, And so you, you're able to adjust basically on the base with the conditions of that day and the clients and take yep. them someplace that suits their needs and launch. You, you, you move from where you launch every time almost. For sure. Yeah. And that's the hardest part. And that's what I get 90% of the time when people reach out. Where are you out of? Yeah. I'm like, I'm out of everywhere. Like <laughs> it can be, it can be anywhere on any given day, you know? So I, and I like to be current. I don't want to say, you know, last June in this spot, the fish were, you know, it was an awesome bite here. I'd rather be current and say, you know, I've actually been here in the last week. So I know I'm more keyed in on what this bite is. It's still no guarantee, which is mm-hmm. the other hard part that you can't guarantee anything. But um, yeah, I, I like to be keyed in on where we go for the most part. Definitely. Yeah. And getting back to that June bite on the tubes, it did seem like in uh, Narragansett Bay, it's become kind of every year. Um, now that Menhaden have come back so big, you know, bunker, pogies, there's a lot of them moving into Narragansett Bay. And I know a lot of the, the charter captains and experience I've had fishing there, it seems like during the daytime, it's like if you don't snag and fish a live bait, you're not going to fool these fish. The exception being um, if you know how to troll a tube and worm. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a good point. Um, the bay lately has been blowing up with bunker and like you said you'll see those reputable charter captains on them Mm -hmm. which will inevitably draw in a bigger crowd (laughs) um so the bay fishing in spring is phenomenal but it can be kind of combat fishing too just because the sheer amount of boats Mm -hmm. and like you said it's either bunker or nothing but it seems like the tube is like the only other thing that can kind of get them to hit if you don't have live bunker or chunking or anything like that and it's the strangest thing i mean we all you know there's this love for striped bass they're beautiful majestic creatures and so they're they're so smart they outsmart us and then you see them eat this thing that's really just a surgical tube that kind of spirals through the water and you're like it doesn't seem to make sense (laughs) i always think about who invented this and like yeah this is going to catch striped bass and then it became one of the most popular things we use in our arsenal too bad they didn't put a uh, patent on it i know seriously (laughs) everyone's making them now but I mean, to that to that point, um, people do like to do different things. So if they want to throw plastics, like we, I use the GT eels as much as I can. Um, and then I had a couple of trips where we did snag bunker and throw them on a hook, and you know clients were catching fish in the bay. So 
Uh, it's not that we make you do any one technique, but we just like to suggest a technique. And if you want to switch after a while, like if the day is going really good or if it's not going so well, then we always chuckle when we say it's kind of angler's choice. Like, what do you want to do? What do you want to work on? What can we help you with? Um, so we can kind of salvage the rest of the trip or either, you know, finish the rest of the trip on a good note because they may have come for one thing. So we want to make sure they also get that and not just whatever we tell them to do. Mm -hmm. Today's episode of the On the Water podcast is brought to you by On the Water Apparel. Visit onthewater.com to shop our selection of original designs on high quality apparel and accessories, including sweatshirts, tees, quarter zips, hats, belts, socks, and more. Use code OTWPOD, that's O T W P O D, to save 15% on your next purchase. So I have to imagine a lot of your clients, um, you know, from this one experience, I'd like to I'd like to hope a lot of them fall in love with kayak fishing. Do you ever hear back from someone that you've taken out and they uh, all the time? A lot. Yeah. yeah. And yep. so they've gone out and purchased their own kayak? A lot of times. Yep. I would say about sixty percent. Um I would yeah, I would say about sixty percent of people go out and buy their own kayak. Um I'm obviously a Hobie guy, but I've had plenty of people buy Old Town and some people buy natives and some other brands. Um so yeah, that's kind of the best part, just seeing how they're doing after the fact, you know, seeing the fish that they're catching and using the same techniques and all that stuff. So I always love to get those emails or DMs mm -hmm. or texts, you know, just to see how um, how people are doing. Yeah, I'm a big uh, I'm a big fan of kayak fishing. It's something I love to do, and that's the one thing I always say to people when they ask questions like they're you know they're hesitant. I don't know. I've never done it before. It looks right. like like just try it. Just try it out. Yeah. Absolutely try it. You will probably fall in love with it, yep. and you're going to be buying a kayak and Absolutely. doing it yourself. Very There's, addicting. Yeah. yeah. So um, let's actually start kind of pull back a little bit here, Dustin. Um, you're not actually from Rhode Island. I'm not. Tell me a little bit about your kind of your fishing journey. What got you into fishing and what led you to kayak fishing in Rhode Island? So I'm from Georgia. Um, I didn't fish when I lived in Georgia. I always like played sports and we traveled a lot as a family. So and my, my folks aren't really outdoorsy people. So we didn't really do that. Although a few times as a kid, like one of one of my good friends, he had a lake in front of his house um, and him, his dad and he, him and his dad fished. Um, so I cast a line into the water, you know, once or twice as a kid. But, you know, we fast forward to you know, being an adult and meeting my wife and moving from Georgia to New England. And um, a friend of mine invited me on his bass boat. My friend Phil invited me on his bass boat to go and fish. So that was my first real uh, fishing experience. And then uh, my other friend, Sam, he always talked to me about fishing. And, you know, from that point on, I just kind of got addicted to it. Um, and just rewinding back, being that my first experience was on a bass boat, um, to me, fishing always was supposed to be offshore in my mind. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm supposed to be off land fishing. So that's what led me to kayak fishing because I wasn't going to buy a boat. Um, that wouldn't have been approved by the wife. So um, I bought a kayak and uh, the rest is history. Like, it's just been, it's been a journey. Yeah. Yeah. And John, are you, um, are you actually a native Rhode Islander? Native Rhode Islander, born and raised. Um, I grew up in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, which is on the Quinnick Island. Mm -hmm. So that's Portsmouth, Middletown, Newport. So um, surrounded by water. Uh, yep, surrounded by water. So I guess it was inevitable. But it's funny. No one in my family really has the bug like I do. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather took me out on his boat when I was... This is where I think it started. But I, I can't pinpoint <laughs> when exactly I got really hooked. My grandfather took me out on his boat, I think, when I was seven. And we scup fished with hot dogs. <laughs> which is hilarious looking back and just catching those fish i think really imprinted on me mm -hmm. and from then it was just um strictly shore fishing just a lot of trial and error um i didn't really have anyone to show me the ropes or get gear handed down to um i think when at that age that was kind of pre-youtube and internet so just a lot of just going out on my own <laughs> a lot of out. failures figuring it out and yeah just learning something new every year um and then with kayaking, I think that started for me about five or six years ago, because mm -hmm. during the fall run, I'd be stuck on the shore and see these insane blitzes a couple hundred yards out, and I'd see kayakers on it. And I'm like, that has to be the coolest thing in the world. Yeah. So I started off with just a normal paddle kayak, quickly mm -hmm. learned that <laughs> sucks for the ocean. <laughs> way too much wind, way too much current. Just was not strong enough to, <laughs> to do that. 
and then eventually jumped into uh, a Hobie Pro Angler, bought it used, and then, yeah, the rest was history. Mm-hmm. Now, you actually, uh, on the website for Rhode Island Kayak Fishing, you're on there as the shore guide. So along with the kayak trips, you also offer some shore trips. Yep, that's correct. Um, started that this season, mm-hmm. taking out, uh, actually, this is the second season, taking yep. out uh, shore clients. In Rhode Island, um, how, how do you find... Well, how's the shore fishing in Rhode Island? Are there issues with access or do you find you have enough places that you can take people and teach them how to <clears throat> catch striped bass and bluefish from shore? Growing up on Rhode Island really helped me with access. Um, mm-hmm. I do have access to a couple spots that um, are normally not really well known about. So that helps me. Um, access is definitely, though, in general, one of the biggest issues of shore fishing. Every year you'll see like, oh, this is private now or something like that going on with shoreline mm-hmm. access. I do really think that will be an issue in the future. And so so you're taking clients out as well. And again, now you probably got some clients who've never maybe done shore surf casting before. Yeah, you get a wide range. Um, there are some guys who have found me through my YouTube channel and are very confident fishermen. I've had one guy come up to be like, hey, you just seem like a cool guy to fish with. <laughs> Um, but a lot of the times I will get beginners that are like, Hey, like I've always wanted a freshwater fish or I've done very small amounts of shore fishing, just kind of want to know the gear and generally what to do. So a lot of beginners. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you get guys that are like, I'm just looking for a huge striper. (laughs) So you get away, (laughs) which are, that's always a little daunting when someone's like, yep, looking for strictly 40 inch plus bass. It's like, oh, yeah, I always aren't, aren't we all, say, right? yeah, yeah. So is everybody else. I always say that it's not a guarantee, but yeah, you get people from all walks of life and it's, it's really interesting. I do. One thing I underestimated about guiding was just the art of meeting new people mm-hmm. and just kind of learning where they're from, their background. And it is really cool taking them down to a spot that I've been to, you know, hundreds of times. And they're like, whoa, this is amazing, like mm-hmm. really scenic. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of makes you realize you start taking things for granted. when Yeah, fishing fish. brings you out to some really, you know, incredible, beautiful places that you take someone out who, you know, has maybe lived in the area or vacation in the area, but they've never been tempted to go to certain areas because they're not fishermen. And so all of a sudden you take them out there and it's, wow, I didn't know. You know, we see that all the time around here on Cape Cod. We get people out down the Elizabeth Islands or away from the beaches that are the normal tourist beaches. And they're like, wow, I didn't even know this existed in Massachusetts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best things about fishing. But um, getting back to those big striped bass that everybody wants to catch. The first time we met, we started talking about um, a technique, which is kind of a, I would say almost a lost art of of chunk bait fishing and chunk chunk bait fishing from shore. (laughs) And we started talking a few years back uh, that you were getting some big fish doing that. And you wrote an article for us about it. So tell me a little bit about uh, why you love chunk fishing from shore and, and, and how you how you approach that. Yeah, that's just another one of those things where like I can't really pinpoint when I started, but it was when I was young. Um, I read an article about chunking and there was something about bait fishing that really appealed to me because mm-hmm. I remember freshwater fishing as a kid. I'd like to bait fish with uh, the bobbers and seeing the bobber go down would just like get me so excited. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I started chunking when I was pretty young, I think around like middle school and started having a lot of success. Um, not just with stripers too, with big blues and stuff. So over the years, I just kind of started fine tuning that, finding the right spots, the right tides to go, um, night in particular, and then really started getting into big fish like a lot of fish over 40 inches fish. Um, I think the biggest one I got chunking was 41 pounds Mm -hmm. and coming from the rocks. That's, that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So over the years, yeah, I've just, um, I chunk with a lot of my clients and at first I'm like, ah, I don't want to sit and watch like just bait in the water. I'm like, just wait, just wait. And when they see a big fish, just totally slam your rod while you're chunking. Mm -hmm. It is really fun. Yeah. So that's definitely a practice I use a lot, especially in the summertime. When that water gets really, really warm, <clears throat> excuse me, I find uh, from the shore, you're obviously limited to how far you can go out. Those big bass start to get lazy and go into deep water. Mm-hmm. And the best way to get a lazy bass in deep water is to sink a chunk of bait right in front of their nose. Absolutely. Um, and are you typically fishing rocky areas, sandy areas? Mostly rocky areas. So there are challenges. Um, getting snagged is one of the biggest ones, mm-hmm. especially with clients. Some people have a tendency <laughs> to, you know, want to check the bait a little bit, reel it in a couple cranks. 
So I really have to emphasize, like, once it's in the water, just just let it sit and do its thing. So that's the strategy in those areas is get the bait out, sink it to the bottom and have it someplace where, you know, have it land on a rock or an area where it can just sit and hold and it's not going to get dragged into a crevice. Yep, definitely bait and wait type method. And again, we'll have, this is all depends on the type of, if I've had clients reach out to me and like, hey, I know you like to chunk, not interested, only want to <laughs> catch drivers with lure. So I'm like, all right, fine, no problem at all. So I have no problem lore fishing for stripers and i do a lot but um chunking at night and in those uh dog days of summer is really a, a big passion of mine and it's funny you mentioned it's kind of like a lost art i feel like not a lot of people knew about chunking until that famous bob the garbage man video mm -hmm. came out mm -hmm. which was just like a hilarious parody on chunking and then after that chunking kind of became like yeah it has it, it, that, that parody kind of made fun of the idea that <clears throat> chunking was a way that sort of old timers fish um and that that was much more common back in the day was would be to go out and you throw bait off the beach and you put a rod in a rod holder and you sit back and wait yep because it was effective and then you know i think surf casting we got so much we had so many great toys we got new rods new reels all these incredible plugs um especially at night, you go out at night and you can work the water and throw all these different, you constantly reach in your bag and change plugs and yep. stack the patience to put out a chunk and actually wait for a big fish to come along, I think is, has what's left. It's kind of cool to see it, it coming back. Yeah. It's definitely the hardest part. I mean, with any kind of fishing is if the bite is slow, you got to be patient. And when you're chunking and not actively casting, yeah, it can get a little boring. Um, but chunking is, it's not as easy as just like sitting bait down and waiting there are some nuances to it like one a big one is is knowing where to go you can't mm -hmm. just throw a chunk out anywhere and expect to catch fish um also the hook set can be a little tricky with chunking um you would think and this does happen but not all the time a striper would just come and inhale it and swim away mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the case i've had really finicky stripers that kind of pick at it and i'm like oh is this like a scup or something and you kind of ignore it and then two seconds later your rod tip is almost down to the rocks like yeah it's there's definitely some nuance to it um and yeah i like showing it to clients because some guys have never chunked before and then afterwards i mean obviously a big fish helps them want to chunk again but afterwards like wow that was a cool way of targeting stripers yep what's the um getting back on that chase for big fish yep. what's the biggest striped bass that you had a client catch on one of the trips I think the biggest from the kayak is like, I want to say 44 and a quarter or 44 and a half. It's wow. definitely 44 inches. But our biggest fish of the year actually came from shore. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's 46 inches that Matt caught. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, Matt, I think it was 45 or 46 inches. Yep. Um, that was his first ever striped bass. Yep. Wow. And first striped bass. Yep. It was from Chunkin. And then uh, my girlfriend, Danielle, has never fished really before. She never caught a striper. I took her chunking and she caught a 43 inch striped bass that was very, very fat too. Like of just a very big fish. And again, with chunking. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely a very effective way to, to target big bass. I think the funny thing is we have that, like, I mean, from the kayak side, that 44 and a quarter, it was threatened a lot this year. Like, Definitely. And the guy that caught that, um, uh, Jim Arno, he also caught the biggest striped bass on a client trip last year. Mm -hmm. So it just happens the stars align for him twice. But, um, you know, any anytime someone would, you know, get a big fish, I'm always thinking, like, is it going to be is it going to beat that 44 and a quarter or whatever the whatever the length of that fish was? Um, but a lot of 43, 42s and 43s, um, some right at 40, but it's just so many. So many. I think um, one of the ones, Stacy, the forty-three came on top water too. Yep, it was on which popper. Was pretty awesome yep. to see. Cool. Yep. Yeah, that's. Yep. I mean, the tube is awesome to catch big fish, but if you see a forty-three inch bass blow up on a popper, it's it's pretty awesome to see. Yep. And with the slot limit, obviously, those big striped bass have to go back. Do yes. you find your clients kind of are understanding, or do you have to have folks who um, are only looking for fish to <laughs> keep? I was going to mention that earlier. Um, People are happy with the big ones at first, but a lot of trips that we had are either a lot of bigs or, you know, some schoolies. Uh, so people that do want to take fish home, they're like, when are we going to get like a slot fish? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I can't <laughs> tell you that. Um, but usually if they, like, on most trips, we kind of get them going and then just let, you know, kind of coach them along the way. But if I know someone wants to, you know, keep a fish, then at sometimes I'll drop a line down and try to help 
try to help them out with that. Find the know. slot fish. Yeah. yeah. Other than <clears throat> striped bass and bluefish, you must also do some trips. Some uh, do you do some bottom fishing trips oh, yeah. as well from the kayak? Absolutely. Early season, people typically want to do uh, tatog and black sea bass, and then um, pretty much from mid October on. My last trip last year was December second, so from like mid October through December, uh, it's pretty much going to be to talk fishing for the most mm-hmm. part and and people enjoy it it's kind of a more social you know kind of stay in place the best you can depending on the current and wind um it's, it's just a different ball game than like going to chase albies or stripers and blues so um, i enjoy those trips a lot dustin is a maniac when it comes to bottom fishing he uh he can find the fish <laughs> he will constantly <laughs> be looking for the next school the next hole to go to he's Really good bottom fisherman on the yak. I try. So let's let's get into the uh, the tog fishing from a kayak because that's. I mean, I feel like in a boat you have an advantage in many ways because you can anchor, or if you've got a trolling motor, you can spot lock on these fish. You've yep. got room to cut crabs and and do all that stuff. Doing it from a kayak has its own challenges. Yeah. How do you approach that? I. What you want to go? Um, I think just step one is. Uh, Pre-cutting the crabs, which is something <laughs> sometimes you overlook. If you kind of hand a client, here's a box of live green crabs. Yeah, they're going <laughs> to they're, like, they're going to uh, run all over the kayak. Yeah. So <laughs> typically, either me or Dustin will just take ten minutes. We'll have a big bucket of crabs, and we're just cutting crabs. So that's step one: is just to get all the bait pre-cut. I Absolutely. think that definitely helps the organization. Yep. And how about positioning? Kayak um, tog fishing is all about being over the right structure and staying there. Right. For bottom fishing, whether it's to tog or black sea bass or even fluke with trying to create different drifts, um, the biggest thing is kayak control. Like if you, a lot of people scope out a lot and they don't know what that means. So when I'm talking to them about it, I'll say, you don't want to scope out too far. In some areas that we fish, you have a, you have ripping current. So these people are either used to shore fishing or boat fishing where all you're worried about is the line itself and the lure. But now you have to worry about, you know, positioning your own kayak. I can't do it for you because all the kayaks are, you know, single person kayaks. You have to worry about that. You have to try to keep the line as vertical as possible against ripping current. So that's what I try to coach the most, because if you don't, you're going to drop your crab down. You're going to stop pedaling and two seconds later, you're going to be like 40 yards back, depending on where we're fishing. And at that point, now you're just dragging your jig across the seafloor and it's going to snag. And I tell people snags happen, but the less you snag, the more time you get to fish. Because if you snag, I'm going to have to retie you up. Mm -hmm. Leader, and I like to go break the leader, so I'm going to have to retie your leader, retie the lure, which is no problem. But I'm you have to remember when I do that, I'm also drifting as well. So, (laughs) So I'm way back here and I have to catch up to you and it just takes a lot of the time away. So the biggest thing is to try to keep your line as vertical as possible is what I tell people and just waiting on the bite. Like to Mm -hmm. talk fishing is different than any other fishing. Like every other fish, if they want a lure, they're going to bite it. Tog will just nibble, 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 nibble. And they don't (laughs) understand it, you know, at first. And, you know, throughout the day, they start to get used to it. But it's just swinging at the right time. That's that's where it comes in. And that's not, um, I don't even know. Sometimes it feels like that's something you can learn and you can get good at. Right. And then sometimes it feels like the tog is still on a certain day. You're never going to quite figure it out. Just when you think you're like, oh, this is now I'm going to swing. Right. Tog fishing is all about embarrassing yourself, swinging uh, wildly yep. and uh, missing and we, fish. We switch oh, over okay. from like, you know, jigs because, I mean, I learn with a jig, but some people would prefer a rig because I think with the jig, you're kind of waiting on that, you know, that right time to, to set the hook while the rig, you actually see that rod go down and you're pretty much reeling it up. So mm-hmm. uh, it's a little easier for some clients. So it's kind of getting to the waterfront and detecting their skill level and you know, what would work better for them and just, you know, letting them go from there. And when you, you're out tog fishing, like you're fishing in a tournament this weekend, I think you mentioned, right? Yep. Oh yeah. And so you'll go out and actually, um, you're not anchoring over structure. You're using the pedal drive to kind of hold in place. Yep. I don't anchor at all. Um, I've, I've tried it before. I don't, I don't love it. Uh, some people do really well with it. Um, but I just, nose into the current and do the best I can with the rudder and the pedal drive system to, uh, to stay in place. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I bet that actually kind of works well because it doesn't keep you exactly in one place. Absolutely. Like when you're on a boat and you're anchored up, you're 
you know, resetting an anchor isn't much fun, whether you're in a no. boat or a kayak. No. So you're kind of forced to like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give this an extra 10 or 20 minutes here. Yep. Whereas if you're in the, you're pedaling, it's really easy to drop back five feet, 10 feet. Yep. Try another little piece of structure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's the strategy for the uh, tournament this weekend? I'm actually on a boat this weekend. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to do kayak, uh, but my friends, um, from last year invited me on the boat last year and I did the tournament via kayak. So this year I decided to do, to do, do it on boat. I was kind of torn. Like, you know, I'm a big part of Rhode Island kayak fishing. So I should be, you know, in the tournament on the kayak side, but I think it's, you know, like I said, talk fishing is fun and social. So I think being on the boat with the, with the guys would be yeah, um, definitely a awesome. good time. Yep. Johnny, are you fishing the tournament from a kayak or are you in a boat as well? I'll be on the yak this year. Yeah. I actually flipped last year. I was on a boat. <laughs> See, we flip flop. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's also a shore option this year. So I was very torn. I was very close to doing shore, but Same. the conditions kind of started to look promising. So I'm like, you know what? I'll do the kayak. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm actually, my girlfriend will be out with me too, fishing it. So um, don't really have a strategy as of yet. Just, just trying to pick the right spot and just ton of bait, ton of chum, and just hope we get a big one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Nice. It's the easiest approach. You don't want to stress yourself out about it. It's like if I get a good one, awesome. If I if I don't, then I still have fun being out here. And you probably end up with a lot of like 17, 18, which are the good eating sides anyway. So if you don't yeah. you don't get on that big one, at least you have some uh some meat to take home. Yeah, that's uh talk fishing. Um, I mean, it doesn't have the glamour, it doesn't have the number of people that striped bass fishing attracts and all that, but it's such a you know, something about the fact that it happens at this point in the season. Yep. When you're you want a little bit of a break from racing after Albies Absolutely. and chasing blitzes and doing all that. That to was be able fun. to to wrap up the season just kind of hanging out with with friends with a group of people and bottom fishing and slows it down a little bit. But you still have it's still exciting. A lot of fun. But it's a, it's really fun. Absolutely. Fishing back to being fun. Absolutely. Definitely the most satisfying hook set is on Tatog. Oh yeah. For a hundred percent. Those things are bulldogs, man. Yeah. They will they will fight you tooth and nail to stay in that structure or whatever they're in. And you know, within like, uh, it's like two seconds after that hook set, you know, pretty quickly, like, is this just another throwback or right. is, whoa, this is a real one. Right. And all of a sudden it's, it is, it's that battle of inches because right. if, if you let that fish take a foot, it gets into a crevice, gets <laughs> under a rock. And depending on the rod you're using, because like slow pitch rods are becoming popular for Tatog and mm -hmm. those things are, you know, those things are noodles. So every, every fish feels pretty big, but like you said, once you, once you hear some drag or, you know, or you feel like you're just stuck that's when you know you got a good one mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um i did some some talk fishing this spring with robbie taylor out in narragansett bay and what surprised me was um the different types of area we fished everywhere from really deep uh it was a wreck down you know pretty deep water mm -hmm. i think i'm trying to remember maybe it's 70 80 feet deep yep. all the way to what seemed to me like incredibly shallow where you know kind of pushing the limits of being in a boat right and he actually said at the time because it was about 10 15 feet of water he said oh yeah there's they're on really shallow rock piles that I just can't get to because I'm in a boat. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing when you're in a kayak that that's, you know, you, you're trying to find those places where boats can't get to. For the most part, I, I mean, we fish a lot of areas that a lot of those charter boats do fish, which mm -hmm. uh, kind of, you know, creates some tension a little bit. <laughs> but we do have some advantages uh, for being on the kayak for tog fishing. Like some spots are like 15 or less feet of water, mm -hmm. you know near some pretty gnarly structure so it's you know it's kind of advantage for the kayak in that in that situation right oh yeah a little less worry about you know bumping your lower unit and for sure hitting oh, a rock yeah you also have to watch out for those pedal drives too in certain areas so of course <laughs> yeah. oh i had one other thing i wanted to ask you we uh we <clears throat> kind of saw a video of yours take off i think it was a video this spring around april you were catching bluefish yes which was famous bluefish famous bluefish because it was really bizarre um <laughs> it was earlier by a few weeks at least than april most 3rd. folks april 3rd yep so april 3rd you were i mean tell us about it <clears throat> yeah so I, I fast forward before i get into the story by just saying the story took on a uh took on legs of its own <laughs> but uh what actually happened was my friend chris carter called me and said let's go to talk fishing and I'm like, it's early. We usually don't do well that first week of April, but let's go. You know, I'm 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 feeling it. Um, 
So I'm, you know, rigging up for Tatog and then uh, myself, Johnny and our friend Keith were just out, I think a day or two before that looking for our fresh, you know, sea lice fish of the year. Uh, so I was already kind of rigged up for, you know, stripers and obviously what end up being bluefish. So I just happened to take that rod with me. We went to the area and we just start, you know, pedaling around looking for Tatog and we totally struck out with that. So we started to mark fish kind of mid water column ish. And, um, you know, being that I had that set up already ready, which is a little um, hard plastic minnow that I had, just kind of casted it out to the fish and I got broken off like right away. And I'm like, OK, this is interesting. And my friend, he had a big uh, like a seven inch SP minnow on. He cast it right to the spot that I broke off on and he ended up hooking up with one. And we're like, OK, it's probably a, you know, bigger than little schoolie that we expected if we did see stripers. Um so he reels it up, fish jumps out of water, boom, it's a blue fish. And we're both kind of shocked about it. So obviously my little hard plastic minnow <laughs> broke off and I had a few more of those in the kayak already. I didn't want to lose any more. So I bummed a jig head off of him and I found this little Z-Man that was probably in my kayak for a year. Um, little Z-Man <laughs> Dormatador. I put it on a little jig head and I cast it out and then I start catching my own. Um, and we caught, we caught so many for I think maybe about an hour and a half or so. And after that, we just like looked at each other and said, and my friend Chris said, I'm glad we sat on these bluefish because we would have totally not gotten anything had we, you know, kept moving and going for a tog. So it was just one of those things that randomly happened. I think if you kind of spend enough time on the water, as we all do, like you see just random things that wasn't expected. I didn't go out targeting those fish that just kind of materialized. Um, and then, like I said, afterwards, there were just so many versions of the story that people reported that I never said. Um, so it kind of took on a life of its own. And no, I think April Fool's jokes for the most part happens the last day of March and April 1st. You know? Right, right. Um, so now, you know, looking back at it, it's like April 3rd, like kind of the April Fool's <laughs> stuff is kind of over with at that point. And yeah, I don't have any reason to make anything up. So, you know, I just let the people, some, a few people knew uh, about, you know, all the details, but you know, you just kind of let everybody wonder, but it wasn't to like set the world on fire and start the, you know, start these early fake reports. It was literally going out for tog and scoring some pretty average size bluefish at best, you know? Yeah. It was yeah. just, it was at that time of year, again, April 30 was so early Absolutely, for yeah. bluefish to show up. Yep. And it's also that time of year where, um, most anglers, mm -hmm. I can say, I think in, in New England, especially we're all glued to social media because we're like, yep. okay, no one's catching yeah. anything. No one's yep. catching yeah. yet. What's showing up? What's going to happen? Too. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we left out of here in the office. We're like, yeah, I mean, that's it's plausible. You came upon us some bluefish. It's really a cool story. You know, you never know. Yeah, um, Matt reached out to me. He said, just so, just to, uh, Matt Hefner. Yeah, he's like. Uh, is this an April Fool's joke before we even get started? And I'm like, Matt, it's totally not an April Fool's joke. Yeah, it'd be pretty weird to make a, uh, I mean, like you said, average size bluefish on April 3rd. Right, it's like, yeah. I didn't really think too much of it until like I posted it, like we were out eating somewhere and I posted it and, and some of the comments were like, awesome. I got quite a few, you know, DMs about it and text messages about it. Um, even into the next day, like I was on the water, freshwater fishing for trout and I just kept, my phone just kept ringing. And usually if my phone keeps ringing, if I'm on the water, it's probably my wife. Like my wife knows if it's something important to keep calling me. So I'll eventually pick up. So I'm fumbling around with everything. I actually end up losing that phone. Cause my, one of my buddies is calling me asking me for, you know, um, you know, the story on what happened. And I'm just like, it's just random, you know? And you never found those fish again. Never. Or? No, no. And it was probably my friend went, uh, he lived way closer to the area than I did. And he went, uh, I think maybe three or four days in a row after that, like somewhere around there in like a week, he went like three or four times and never found him again. Yeah. Cause it was probably three or four weeks at least until there were maybe even longer until there were actually kind of consistent bluefish in the area. It Correct. was bizarrely early, but cool story. Like Crazy. you said, you spend time in the water, you yep. run into things like yeah. that. It was never it was never like in my wildest imagination that I would think that we'd be on bluefish. I thought if we didn't find the Tatog, we would find a group of, you know, schooly stripes with mm -hmm. some sea lice. And that would be like the, you know, highlight of the trip. But I mean, I love catching bluefish. So they came to play and that was, that was pretty <laughs> awesome. So. 
Now, another fish that seems to be, uh, fish seems to be making kind of a comeback in, especially in Rhode Island, is weak fish. Yep. You guys been running into more weak fish out in Rhode Island? Yeah, I think this Spring year. time was pretty nuts this season. Yeah. yeah, we both start targeting them. Our friend Keith is actually kind of, uh, between the three of us, kind of the weak fish uh, whisperer. Mm -hmm. um, but we just kind of catch them for fun. Um, and they're around, you know, areas that we fish. So it's like, why not target them, you know? And then clients want to catch them, so. You know. And so you, this spring, I guess, was pretty good. What type of areas are you targeting them? And what are you, are you doing something differently to, to catch weak fish versus going after stripers? I don't think so. No, not really. The first one I caught this season, I was just trolling a little uh, x wrap, I think, for stripers mm -hmm. and a weak fish hit it. And I was like, oh, it's funny because I'm not super like, I know some guys really like weak fish. I kind of catch them like, oh, cool, weak fish. Yeah, like mm -hmm. they don't really make me tick. Um, but that being said, if you did catch one like six years ago, people would be like, oh, that's super, super rare. And it seems like these past couple of seasons now we can, they're really making a comeback. Yeah. yeah. It's good to see. I mean, I, uh, 20 years fishing Cape Cod, always heard about them. I mean, I fish a, a place called Squatigue Harbor, you know, there's places named <laughs> nice. after them. And for, you know, a couple of decades, it was like this mythical thing that, you know, I had never seen one. I had heard like, you know, there'd be a story of a guy was, you know, you know kind of make news guy was fishing for black sea bass and got one and then all of a sudden when you know when i caught my first one it's like this you just kind of stare at it like it's a unicorn and it's yep. beautiful and it's yep. amazing and now it's kind of like yeah okay great they're they're around they're back they're, that'll yeah. happen yeah, yeah. i and, think that is kind of not to do a subject change but i feel like that might start happening with albies in the next couple of years because we had a, a pretty legendary <laughs> september for albies at least mm -hmm. in rhode island and a couple trips where it's like I think I got 13 albies in one trip on the kayak yep. and it gets to the point where it's just like, yep, they're, they're around. That's another Albie. Yeah. And then everyone's catching them. Like people that never caught them before are having like double digit days and you know, it's just, yeah. Every fish is kind of making a comeback and losing some of its unicorn status. Yeah. I, I, and I mean, this is just my perspective. I've only been fishing uh, on the Cape since 2000, but there were some falls and some years in there where the albies just didn't really show. We had like right. a terrible year, like, you know, oh yeah, there were a few caught early, but they just didn't really show up in some areas or it was a one week run and then they were gone. Right. We've been a little spoiled. I think that oh, for it sure. seems like it's been con pretty consistent for maybe the last five, six, maybe even 10 years of we come to expect them showing up here uh, on the Cape and sticking around for a good month, month and a half, even even longer sometimes and having really good fishing. So it always starts with you guys. <laughs> yep. You always see the, the Cape Cod guys. It's like, all right, what last week of August or maybe even before that, you know, you guys are on them. And then it's like, should I make the journey to the Cape? And then boom, we got them. So it's, yeah, it's, just it's stay put, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Albies seem to move into new England waters. Like they come into the Cape and the islands first yep. and then spread West and even South. Like they don't hit long Island first necessarily right. in New York. Like they hit the Cape first and spread that way. Yep. Whereas with stripers, you guys in Rhode Island, it's like the West wall. We always hear like, you know, that's the first, that's, mm -hmm. that's where yep. the schoolies first show up in numbers. Right. Absolutely. Maybe there's a couple on the South side of Martha's vineyard, mm -hmm. but you guys tend to get a head start on the stripers. They move from the other direction right. and spread yeah. out to the East. Yep. So, yeah, you see the New York guys down there killing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, and we're like, when are they coming our way? And, you know, all of a sudden we get them. And then once we get them, it's just, it's like that until like August when the bite starts to slow down. Now, when it does start to slow down, you said you do kayak fishing right up to December in salt water sometimes. Do you switch then and start doing more fresh water? In December, yes. Yep. So I'll, I'll go for it to tog as long as I can, but, um, like the saltwater season is kind of so short. And as a guide, that's what a lot of people want to catch uh, saltwater species here in Rhode Island and the other areas that I fish. Uh, so early spring and then late into the winter is usually the time that I'm able to do uh, most of my freshwater fishing for mm -hmm. largies or largies, pike or trout for the most part is what I'm targeting. Nice. Yeah. How's the pike fishing in Rhode Island? I can't really say it's lights out. Like I, I wouldn't really call myself necessarily a pike fisherman. I know how to target them. I've caught a few good ones, but um, it's it's okay. There's like a couple little ponds that that have um, surprisingly uh, some nice sized pike, and then our then our river systems have some some pretty mm -hmm. good pike. But yeah, and then in the springtime, I mean, uh, you said after ice out, you'll kind of get back into the freshwater stuff again. Oh yeah, right away. Yeah. And what is what's that like? You know, uh, 
do you, do you see like as soon as the ice leaves, is it a kind of slow, lethargic, largemouth bass, or are you heading after trout, or what's the what's I'll, the target? I always go for largies first, and then I'm kind of watching um, to see when the stockings happen for uh, for trout, which usually in mass you guys are way ahead of us in Rhode Island, um, and also Connecticut is ahead of Rhode Island, so I'll kind of go to one of those two states if I want to do trout, but I'll typically start for largemouth, and it's always pretty deep water other than days where you get those um you get those like a, a warm front to push in then a lot of largies will push pretty shallow and you you know if you're familiar with a pond you know where they're going to be they're going to be mm -hmm. where that vegetation was in the spring and summer you know they're coming up to feed a little bit and then you know when you get that cold front they'll tuck back down deep again so you're using a lot of a lot of spinning gear you know or or even some swim baits if they're shallow and they, they might take a swipe at it Mm -hmm. I always like throwing the large stuff. I know that Jimmy is kind of a swim baiter as well. So yeah, and Jimmy yeah. was uh, he was supposed to be here today on the podcast, but an opportunity came up to go and do a two day offshore trip on the Helen H. So he's off in the canyon somewhere. Hopefully, I don't blame him. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> catching some tuna. But yeah, if he was here, we'd probably go on an, on an hour long uh, sidebar here about oh, being yeah. swim baits and, and doing I, I that. love it. Do uh, oh, holdover yeah. fishing too in the oh, spring yeah. before the migratory bass come. That'll uh, that keeps so me hold sane. over hold over striped bass fishing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found a couple good spots where we've had you know trips where we're catching four, five, six holdovers in a trip. And I used to associate holdover fishing with just freezing your ass off and right. maybe catching one ten inch striper. But right. it seems to have improved over the years, and that kind of keeps me sane because I don't freshwater fish too too much. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's another thing like uh like we were just talking about the way the fisheries change and evolve um it was it used to be tough to find holdovers there were a few kind of discrete areas where you'd get them i know i made some trips up to downtown providence on a cold winter <laughs> oh, night yeah. i used to do that <laughs> yeah. providence river back in the yeah. day yeah and it's fishing in some you know kind of sketchy places <laughs> yeah. under, <laughs> under a bridge and that and uh really to catch a you know, you catch one 12 or 14 inch striped bass that doesn't really fight because it's so cold. <laughs> right. Then but it was happy. cool to do yeah. it. Like, yeah. I, got a, I got a striped bass in right. January. Like, this is the best. Yeah. Whereas now, um, like you said, there's some spots where guys are going out, they're kayak fishing um, and able to catch numbers of fish and even it's some pretty, pretty big good ones sized too. ones. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, I wonder if it's like every year or more stripers choosing not to migrate south and hold <laughs> over. Um, I wonder why that's actually happening, but I mean, I'm not complaining. Yeah. I'm pretty happy that the holdover fishing's improving. Absolutely. And and without giving away any specific spots, it does seem to be, um, I mean, you're not going out in the open ocean for the most part. No. No. Definitely so, brackish. Yeah. So kind of brackish waters, look to salt ponds, rivers, things like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and, you know, kind of also kind of like the bluefish you found. Yep. If nobody's looking for them, they're not going to find them. Correct. So, yep. Yep. Exactly. But if you go out, you know, and pick your days, um, be safe, obviously cold water, but yep. pick your days and get out there. You can maybe find some holdover striped bass that nobody knew about. Yeah. That's, that's usually what happens. Like he mentioned about his weak fish and it, I was out there the day he caught it. It was pretty, pretty nice size one too. He's just trolling for stripers and then boom, you just never know what you'll get when you're on the water. So just embrace it, you know? Nice. Yeah. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, Guys, it's been great having you here on the podcast. Um, nice to hear about Rhode Island fishing and kind of touch on all aspects of it. And also hear about what you're doing with kayak guiding, which I think is so important. Um, love the fact that between guiding on kayaks and then also doing some shore, you're really bringing new people into the sport, Absolutely. getting them excited and, you know, creating more fishermen, which I'm all about. It's a good thing. Blessing and curse. It <laughs> gets a little more crowded, but, you know, For sure. like we always say we need uh, we need more of us. out Absolutely. There. Absolutely. We're we're conservationists for the most part, and right. um, yeah, we're going to keep this sport alive, keep it growing. Absolutely. So, guys, thanks for being here again. Dustin Stevens, he is the owner and operator of Rhode Island Kayak Fishing Adventures. Definitely look for him as Dustin Goes Fishing on Instagram. And if you're interested in getting out kayak fishing or doing a little shore fishing with Johnny, look them up on the website and uh, book a trip. Like you said, you're doing everything from spring freshwater all the way to tog in December. Yep. So, plenty of opportunities to give it a shot. Um, Johnny, again, look him up, YouTube channel, Fishing with Johnny. And then also, if you're a TikToker. TikTok. On, I had to jump on the uh, the TikTok train. And he is doing, it is uh, fishing videos, so you will not find him on there doing dances. As or, much as I wanted. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe we'll collab. <laughs> on, the water has, on the Water has a TikTok page, that. so uh -oh. maybe we'll do, we'll do some collabs. That would um, be hilarious. But yeah, thanks for having us, Kevin. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it.
Today's episode of the On the Water podcast is brought to you by On the Water Apparel. Visit onthewater.com to shop our selection of original designs on high quality apparel and accessories, including sweatshirts, tees, quarter zips, hats, belts, socks, and more. Use code OTWPOD, that's O T W P O D, to save 15% on your next purchase. 